Welcome to the State Historical Society of Iowa and our last Iowa Stories Lecture for 2021. My name is Mary Bennett and today we are honored to host Stephanie Bad Folger Snow as part of our celebration of Native American Heritage Month. A few housekeeping notes before we proceeding with our program. I'd like to thank Allison Johnson, Hang Nguyen, and Cheryl Scott for their technical assistance today. Please mute, mute your microphones and enter your questions and comments in the chat box. And at the end of the program, Allison will read those questions to Stephanie if we have time. November has been designated as Native American Heritage Month. There's no question that alliances need to be formed and people need to listen to the voices of Native Americans to hear the passion and urgency in their messages. I have great respect and admiration for Stephanie, who I've known for over a decade. We first met when we worked together to launch the Meskwaki Cultural Center and Museum. She helped organize the space and exhibits, purchase male and female mannequins that could be dressed in appropriate regalia, and secure track lighting for the exhibits, making it all a very professional space. Stephanie Bad Soldier Snow celebrates her Meskwaki and Ho-Chunk ancestry by working to raise awareness through social activism and advocacy. Stephanie graduated from Grinnell College and is a trained anthropologist and cultural consultant. When I look at Stephanie, I admire her. She is a water protector and an environmentalist, an expert in Meskwaki foodways, a bead worker, and an artist. She's also a talented and powerful singer, a songwriter and poet, and an amazing dancer. She currently works for the Meskwaki Workforce Development as their education coordinator. For me, Stephanie is a beacon of light and hope. We know you will learn things you never knew today, and we hope to change your perspectives. Please join me in welcoming Stephanie. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much, Mary. Um, I'd like to give my thanks to start with um, to the State Historical Society. And I um, really have to say thank you to Mary for um, years of a lot of emotional and academic and um, professional support. So thank you very much, Mary, for that introduction. So to start with, obviously you just heard um, an introduction from Mary about who I am, but I think um, it's important to sort of um, do that for myself as well, just to kind of um, give you a little bit of a picture of, uh, of my background and, and what I've um, what I've been doing over the years, which is, um, so I have to say that my uh, primary identity is Meskwaki. I was born and raised on the, on the settlement and that's all I really know. Uh, it's really who I am. And I think um, of all the things that Mary listed as um, uh, my identity and, and what I do, um, I think the one of the biggest things, the most important things is that um, as, a, as a mother, that's my greatest responsibility um, and source of happiness and, and also um, hopefully a legacy. So today we're gonna talk about some things that are a little bit difficult. Um, we'll get through all of that. I feel like it's really important for any of us as um, groups of people and then as individuals to go, we have to go through the stuff. I could use a different word there, but <laughs> we have to go through the really difficult stuff, the hard stuff before we get to our healing. We have to really face these things. And I started this whole journey, I have to say when I was about 15, um, when I really started to question what I was eating and how that was making me feel. And um, then I went into college and I started to question then, well, um, I'm very different from the rest of my family members. And despite a, a lot of um, broken familial ties, things that should have really affected uh, my identity as a traditional native person, traditional Meskwaki, um, I somehow went the other direction and um, I'm very different from my family members. And so I was looking at how my own individual trauma was making me who I was and then um, how was I gonna heal that? And then I started running. I think I was about 19 when I started running. So I came to this topic by that, by that journey. 
um, and realize that there are a lot of things, not just in my own personal history and experience, but also as being a Native American person. And so that's why today's um, topic is really important to us. Uh, and because Native people matter, right? Um, these things are sort of collectively experienced, but then also we have our own individual stuff to go through. So this is what we're going to be talking about today and how to heal. So to start with, um, we just have to start with some basics. And for some of you, you, you might know some of this data, but um, so number one is our population size. We were at 1.0.8% of the total US population. And now we've grown to almost 2%, I think was the last count, but um, I kind of like to stick it in there sort of halfway because I feel like um, it's a bit of an overestimation. I feel like there are a lot of people who are um, uh, marking Native American on the census and that's where I get this information. Um, at one point, just for other sort of um, context, it's really interesting. I had tried to track down a lot of numbers at one point when I was trying to update my information and I got all the way to the US um, Census Bureau and they told me that our population is so small that they don't even bother. There's a lot of stuff that they don't even report. And this shows up also in our education um, information as well. So we know that our population size decreased 95%, which is tremendous from the time of Columbus until um, uh, the time of our country's establishment. Um, so in less than 300 years, nearly all of us were wiped out. Currently, we are at 574 federally recognized tribes, and there are still others that are applying for that recognition. Um, education statistics are currently, we are at about a 60% graduate, uh, um, graduation rate from high school. Um, that's, that's gone up, that has increased. Um, and there's some question about that. Like I was saying, um, our statistics are not all the way accurate because they, they just really don't bother with our numbers. So about, four, uh, excuse me, about 17% attend college, about 14 of our total college graduates in the country are native. Um, and rate of master's attainment or higher we actually don't know that number. That's one of those things that we um, try to look at and they do not have numbers for. They just don't find us to be significant enough statistically. Um, one thing I wanna note here is that the um, income of native women is the lowest of all groups um, in this country. So we also have the highest poverty rate in the country, but we're the highest, we have the highest rate of military service per capita. That's something to be proud of. Um, we also have the lowest life expectancy of any other population. And we will talk a little bit about that. So um, again, to sort of put this into perspective, to um, bring into context, uh, we know that the Native American experience in this country has been um, and again, largely experienced by Native Americans across the country, uh, colonization, massacres. Uh, we have had the internment of tribes. We have to really think about that because we know that the reservation system was more of a concentration camp than anything. Um, repression of indigenous practices, beliefs, language and identity. Um, a lot of it was taken from us or outlawed. Um, we faced paternalism. So we have to also understand that there was a, quite a debate going on for quite a long time um, in Congress, whether or not Native American people were even human. And so um, the establishment of the Indian Citizenship Act in 1924 kind of told us that, oh, okay, well, they're human beings. And things like the Museum of, um, excuse me, the uh, Smithsonian, and then we have the Department of the Interior. You have to remember that those were at one time under the Department of War, <laughs> and then under the Department of um, 
resources. So we were we have never really been looked at. We've been looked at as enemies, or we have been looked at as some type of maybe animal. Um, and that goes along with that that uh, whole debate on whether or not we were even human beings. So, um, and of course, we experience a cultural dissonance um, because of our education system, which is not necessarily um, made with us in mind, obviously, and is really meant to assimilate. Um, through these uh, different events came things like I said, the Indian, uh, Indian Citizenship Act of 24, Indian Re Reorganization Act in 1934, that's where we get CDIB, which is the Certified Degree of Indian Blood. We have, we're the only group of people that have to show um, and prove that we are in fact Native American by blood quantum. Um, we also have the Indian Relocation Act of the 1950s that went all the way into the 1970s, which um, moved people from their tribal communities into urban areas. And then we have the Indian Child Welfare Act and the Re Religious Freedom Act in 1978. Um, so it's really interesting to think about um, Religious Freedom Act actually, because as we were practicing our ways, we were a bunch of outlaws because it was actually against the law to do that. So colonization, what is it? The only statement that there is in um, our constitution that sort of sets up everything for us and all of our policies and things like that, um, that allows uh, the government to have any type of relationship with us is that the um, the Article One, Section Eight, Clause Three, which is Congress shall have power to regulate commerce with the Indian tribes. Um, I am not a lawyer, so I won't get into all of that. But um, it also it sets up our relationship with the federal government, and um, it's just interesting to me to see the word commerce because. Um, Everything is always about money. <laughs> um, we have been politically dependent and considered wards of the state. Obviously, reservations were a big part of that. We are treaty dependent. So um, the basics that we have been promised in our treaties are listed right there for you. And um, dare I say that a lot of times uh, those things have been at the lower quality and have been quite a challenge for us. Um, and I can still remember uh, in fairly recent years, uh, things like um, food, for instance, getting commodities. So that's one of those things that has really been a detriment to us and rather than a help. And we at one time, I guess we would say going all the way back to reservation times when we were getting rations, those rations were a lot of times not healthy, not even edible, um, were rancid or had bugs, things like that. And so um, we were not even able to, to eat those things. And aside from that, we didn't know what to do with flour and lard and things like that. And we learned from uh, we learned from Americans how to make fry bread. And so that's um, actually a recipe that comes from concentration, concentration camp times. So we know that we are currently um, in an economy that is cash dependent. So this means that we went from a livelihood that was um, based in kinship system, it was based in a gift economy rather than cash. Um, and this is something that is imposed on us, uh, very different from our, our way of life. And so then this takes us from a holistic sense of wealth, which means that we, um, our relationships were very important. Uh, the ability to go out and hunt or to go out and gather food free, freely 
things like that. And then to, um, to be able to share with each other without having currency was a far healthier way for us to live. And so placing the cash economy onto us is um, something that makes us um, impoverished. Uh, I can tell you that all the way up until I was 12 years old, uh, we did not have running water. We went out and we pumped our water. Uh, we used a wood stove to heat our house and to cook our meals. And to the greater American society, that means poverty. Um, but for me, I remember feeling like I was rich. I didn't know any better or I didn't know the difference. Right? Historical trauma. So what is historical trauma? Um, historical trauma is a cumulative emotional and psychological wounding over a lifespan and across generations that results from massive group trauma. We know that um, this response is observed among Native American populations, among um, Jewish Holocaust survivors uh, and descendants as well, Japanese American internment camp survivors and their descendants. And then uh, to kind of help you to understand this a bit, it's sort of like PTSD collectively, right? Um, however, it is far more complicated. And when you throw in individual traumas, it becomes very complex. And it doesn't really quite meet uh, the criteria of what PTSD is. Um, it's, it's a little more than that, it's heavier than that. And historical unresolved grief is the ongoing underlying grief that accompanies this trauma. So I know I'm kind of going through this quickly, um, but it gives you an idea of kind of how heavy this is and to be able to sort of um, bring everything that I've already mentioned down to this concept. And here is a graphic for you to take a look at as far as effects and symptoms of historical trauma. Um, you can see that depression, anxiety, fear and distrust of the government a lot of times. One of the um, statements that used to, I used to hear a lot as a kid was, we don't sign papers. You know, uh, they made a, they tricked us into signing this. And so, you know, that was one of those things. So that's that fear and distrust. Um, you go to a federal office for any kind of um, assistance or to understand maybe social security or whatever you a lot of a lot of times people will not um, ask the questions they really want to ask um, I actually once worked for a state um, organization and people were reluctant to sign things um, and it was just a little uncomfortable for them um, and you can see the rest of these um, symptoms of historical trauma and I will just let you kind of take a look and I will move on. So now that we have talked about colonization and we've talked about historical trauma, what is decolonization? So decolonization is a lit legitimate action by indigenous communities to to exercise self-determination. So this means to break the ties of dependence, right? So we talked about being dependent um, on the federal government in some ways and to break those ties. Whether we like it or not, whether we believe it or not, <laughs> we are colonized in a lot of ways. Um, to use the, this, this will get um, some of my native viewers right now um, maybe get a little chuckle out of out of you for this one, but um, Faith Spotted Eagle said it like this. She said, real carried away colonized in a, a national meeting that I was present at. So this means making decisions for yourself on a small scale and on larger scales, right, on a daily basis. It takes a lot of thought. You need to be conscious about this. Um, and another question that kind of comes along with this is, if it didn't make sense 
200 years ago, 300 years ago, 500 years ago, um, why were you doing it now, right? So to really question what it is that our ancestors would have been doing and what makes sense, what is logical um, that has cultural relevance and um, is less connected to our experience as American citizens. So the key to decolonization is understanding sovereignty and self-determination. Self-determination means then making that decision consciously um, about your choices every day, um, both as an individual then and as nations, right? As native nations. Each tribe has an in inherent right, which means you are born with that right, to govern itself. Um, two specific areas that I would like to talk about are, um, or excuse me, that are important in this are the right to transfer land and possession, excuse me, land possession and the right to negotiate or, or make treaties with foreign nations. Those are two things that we cannot do. Um, so again, whether we like it or not, um, that's something that the federal, U.S. federal government can do that we cannot do as Native nations. Uh, tribal authority is um, up to us, really, like to form tribal governments, to determine our tribal uh, membership, what is the eligibility to be a member of a tribe, to regulate individual property, to levy and collect taxes, we can do that, to maintain law and order, to uh, exclude non-members from our tribal territories, to regulate domestic relations, and to regulate commerce and trade. So there's that one statement again from our uh, constitution. So one thing that I would like to uh, suggest right here, and especially for our, our native people that are um, on the call with us today, um, a very small thing that we could do that helps us to exercise our sovereignty or to make it um, visible, right, is to um, fly our flag either even with the United States flag or just below it, but definitely above the state flag because we do not um, concede to the state, we actually do to the federal government. So. That's just a small thing that I would kind of throw out there and and see if anybody takes me up on. Um, decolonization, exercising sovereignty, it really takes work, right? And what we, um, what is kind of hard to do, right, is to motivate our, our people to actually do the work. It's really easy, so we're going to get into food, right? But I'll use this example. It's very easy to go to the grocery store and buy whatever you want, especially now that we have um, uh, incomes to to do that. And but what it, how how revolutionary of an act it is to continue growing our our corn, our traditional corn. Um, so we we continue to do that at Meskwaki and to take that out of this idea that that is it's sacred it's definitely sacred but that it should only be eaten at certain times right that's one of those small things that we can do we're feeding we should be feeding ourselves things that um our bodies recognize and are traditional for us but for some people that's too much work right and other things um, and not everybody's always willing to do the work that leads toward decolonization. So, we've talked about historical trauma or collective trauma, and now we will talk about individual trauma. One of the things that um, I'm sort of alluded to at the beginning was that um, I can't really speak for Native people as a whole, um, but that a lot of the statistics or a lot of the experiences are mine as well as an individual. And um, I can say that I fall into these, um, these categories 
And that's me just getting a little bit vulnerable with you and allowing you to know a little bit about my own personal life. Um, but I definitely went through a lot of trauma as an individual growing up and then um, as a young woman. Uh, some of these things are really heavy to understand or to, to learn about, but um, our, our youth are telling us that they have gone through a lot of trauma. They still continue to do that. And we know that in certain areas in the country, there are um, very high rates of suicide. And so that needs to be um, talked about and not hidden. The other thing is that we know also now it's a it's a widespread uh, movement, but our missing and murdered indigenous women, but also the um, the just the assault and the um, the fact that our these assaults and these violent acts are not being reported a lot of the time because either they are afraid to do so or there's just not a lot of attention given to it. Um, they often will not uh, prosecute these individuals and it kind of depends on where these things are happening as well. If they're happening on tribal lands, there are other there are laws that kind of prevent some of that stuff from happening. Uh, boy, it, in some areas, it has become almost like that's this, if you want to do something to someone, that's where you go is um, to be on tribal lands, you can escape prosecution. Um, and then of course we have inaction by authorities. So again, with all that we already know, there's um, that distrust again that comes up with this. Uh, the other thing that we tend to think of as a historical um, experience, but actually affects a lot of us even to this day, there are still, we still have boarding schools that are open. The experience there, I think, is slightly different than it was previously. But um, as an example, to know that uh, generally, generationally this affects us, um, my grandmother was someone who went to boarding school and talked about, um, rarely talked about the things that happened to her. But one of the things that she did share with us was that if she was punished for uh, speaking her language, she would be given a small toothbrush to clean the floors in the, in the, um, the women's dorms. So, and beyond that, she really didn't share too much. Um, but that's, that's, pretty difficult to think about. You're on your hands and knees um, cleaning the floor with a toothbrush. And my husband himself, um, both of his parents were products of the boarding school as well. So this is something that's fairly recent for us. This is not something way back in history that still affects us. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have uh, the lowest life, life expectancy than other groups in the country. Um, we're at about five and a half years less than other groups combined, and we have the highest rates of suicide, diabetes, cancer, adrenal imba imbalances, and comorbid uh, depression, PTSD, as we mentioned. Um, so one of the other things that since we're going to be talking about food a little bit, um, these things can actually be uh, alleviated by what you eat. Um, we know that about 90% of chronic illness can be changed with diet. So uh, if any of you are familiar with uh, maybe Ayurvedic or Chinese medicine, they talk about three parts of us um, as, an, as a human being, the mind, body, spirit concept. Well, for us, it's very, it's a slightly different. We recognize four parts to us um, and we are all constantly looking for a state of balance. The body um, as an organism looks for a state of balance um, constantly. And for us, the change, excuse me, the difference is that we look at mental and emotional as um, two different things. Uh, mental is a little bit more of the cognitive, the logical thinking, the analyzation, those kind of things. And emotional are obviously your feelings. Um, and 
what I understand is that, um, so I'll give you an example. I was talking to my uncle once that, um, and I was doing my best not to cry because I was taught not to cry. And my uncle said, go ahead, cry. The creator gave you that, those emotions so you feel them. When you have those feelings, feel them and, and honor them because that's how you were created. And so um, we look at those two things differently. And obviously then we have physical and spiritual. And if I want to go back to that real quickly, um, and if one um, part of you is out of balance, um, the other parts will it will sort of try to um, bring you back to balance or they will sometimes suffer as well along with. Um, so just kind of imagine yourself um, now that, oh boy, I guess with COVID, um, a lot of people have gone, kind of gone through this, but um, your physical body is out of balance and, and struggling. And so therefore, you know, it kind of affects your, your mental um, abilities, your emotions. Um, and then of course, um, we're, I see a lot of people asking for prayer. And so that um, brings the spiritual um, up and um, more focus on that. So that's just an example. So, We have a stark difference between the philosophies of native people um, compared to the settler philosophy. And so this is kind of to help you to understand that this goes all the way back to, um, um, and this is not to pick on anything, but this is how um, Manifest Destiny came about, but um, through the Bible, um, Christianity, the introduction of Christianity. And um, one of the very first things that is said in the Bible is that man has dominion over the earth and all that inhabit it. And so that's the mindset that they're coming to this land with. And so um, then you get sort of the license to, to just go forth and settle and take over land and all of that. And for us, it's very different. Uh, we're a part of everything. Um, I always say, you know, I'm looking at a tree out, outside my window and um, I am no different than that tree. I'm no better than that tree, right? Um, to me, that's, a, that's another spirit that has every right to live just as much as I do. And for us as Meskwaki people in particular, um, our origin story tells us that we were created from this earth. And so it sets up an immediate um, intimate relationship between ourselves and the earth. We're not separate from it. We are made from the very thing that um, that we should be looking out for and everything that lives in it and on it, right? So um, the underlying uh, feeling with all of that constantly is a sense of respect for everything that is, that is on this earth. And um, we now, so to go back to the idea of the cash economy and capitalism, um, that means for the settler philosophy that there's a right to um, control the earth and to use the resources to depletion. Um, we're really seeing the effects of all of that with climate um, right now. And if anybody is noticing things like um, high winds, a lot of times that's something that happens in deserts. And so we also know that here in Iowa, the topsoil is pretty much gone uh, and we need to kind of get farmers into the um, this idea of uh, regenerative um, work so uh, to kind of improve and, and bring back our topsoil and the the right to control and those kind of things that that actually includes human life as well we, I mean obviously we've seen that with our policies and um, the way that the government has dealt with native people. So, so this is something that's really interesting. Um, I came across a medical journal that talks about uh, the microbes in soil. So one thing I need to say right off uh, the bat is that uh, the place that our mental health, like our, um, excuse me, um, everything, that it, it all starts in the gut. So again, right from the time that you are putting something in your mouth, those kind of things start to happen. 
This is a direct connection between your gut and your brain. Uh, so the journal was um, talking about the uh, ways that uh, serotonin and other hormones are uh, produced in the gut and how that um, affects your brain. And so if you are eating uh, a food from say your garden or uh, from an organic farm or something, you're gonna really get a lot of good things from that. Not just nutri nutrient dense food, but also these microbes that are really good for your body and for your brain. Um, the ways that we get that obviously are from inhalation. So we're out there working in our garden. We breathe that in, it's great. Um, our skin is our largest organ. And of course, working again out in the dirt, it kind of gets into you that way as well. And then um, ingestion, so eating these foods that are really important for you. Um, the farm effect is actually really interesting as well. That was another another journal that talked about this, and what they found was that the uh, rural homes compared to urban homes, they actually had the same total number of uh, microbes in their environment. However, in the rural uh, home. Uh, environment, they found a larger diversity of microbes. And so the more diversity there is, the more there is for your body to work, um, result in a stronger immune system. This also resulted in lower incidence of um, asthma, and they found uh, urban homes, um, children being raised in urban homes um, had a lot more asthma than rural homes. Okay, so now we're going to talk about food. And we're going to talk about understanding sovereignty is absolutely essential. We use that word quite often. <laughs> Uh, a lot of us will kind of throw it around, well, we're sovereign, and they tend to think that that means we can do whatever we want, which is not exactly the case. But to really understand that word, uh, what the legal sense of that word is, but to also understand what that means um, in the tribal sense. And so to exercise your rights as an indigenous person, um, to kind of, <laughs> I don't want to say but the system, but you know, to kind of challenge the system that we, has been imposed on us. So um, go to your tribal elders and your spiritual leaders. Um, I was very, very nervous doing this as a 15, 16 year old when I was really starting to change how I, how I ate my food choices. But I um, mustered up the courage to talk to um, some older gentlemen about these things and actually discovered that the way that I was thinking about food was really the way um, that was tied to deeply rooted in our belief system. And so um, to me, it was just logical, but I wanted someone to kind of talk to about that. And, and so there were people for me. So uh, I do have it listed further down. These were relatives of mine. And so I utilized the kinship system in a positive way in that in that sense. Um, I will say that uh, mainstream uh, practitioners are also important because since we live in a modern world, there are some things that we will um, need to process in a more modern um, with more modern therapies, um, psych, um, excuse me, uh, counselors and, and things like the mental health counselors. That has its place, so utilize those things as well. They have um, done some studies on language revitalization, cultural reclamation, return to ceremonies, because we know that a lot of cultural loss um, and of course um, being that our ways were outlawed for quite some time um, to really understand to start to learn about the ceremonies that we had previously 
have all been extremely helpful to people who were experiencing um, uh, suicidal ideation, who were uh, imprisoned, things like that. They were really noticing a lot of change in people when they started to go back to uh, their older ways of life and their languages. So I think that's really interesting. Um, I already mentioned this, but to honor our kinship system, and I know that some of my relatives are on here. <laughs> um, and there's a lot in that. I've noticed that with our students, I actually um, worked for our tribal school for a while, and, and with our students, they didn't know how they were related to each other. And if they knew that, uh, their di the dynamics would change, and a lot of healing in um, behaviors and things like that would happen if they were to understand that more, more fully. So obviously physical activity is really important to healing. Um, dietary changes. So I do have a list for you of some, some foods that I compiled. Uh, I have a Google Doc and so that will be put into the chat. There's a link there that you can take a look at. And there are now more resources out there if you just Google them um, for some ideas for grocery shopping or for um, food gathering, hunting, things like that. A really important thing though is that if you feel like uh, you're not really able to do some of these things, maybe you don't have the space to garden or maybe you don't really know right now, you don't really know a lot about uh, foraging or um, collecting medicines, things like that, then at least, at the very least, when you go to the grocery store, choose the, the most healthy thing possible. And to me, that is local and clean. And clean means um, we, the word organic is kind of misunderstood, uh, especially in my community. Um, people don't really understand what organic means, but I, I'm a proponent of that because that is um, growing food without chemicals. And that's the way we've always done it. And so if that's what you can find at the grocery store, then um, Good for you. So make those choices. A return to meditative practices. So this is another word that I know that people um, might not connect with, but we've always had a way to sort of center, to calm um, and things like that, but we didn't call it meditation, just like we didn't call our food organic, right? Um, but meditative practices and to learn how to do that just to just to cut, help keep yourself um, um, clear thinking and uh, sort of control the way that you re, uh, respond to different things. So um, it's good for your adrenal system. To spend some time in nature. Uh, this might be harder for some of you who are in urban areas, but some, I mean, that's what parks are for. So if that's the that, if that's the best thing that you can get to, then um, spend some time just sitting with a tree, or sitting on the ground, things like that. But um, one of the things that I do is I still go back to um, the area that my uh, that I grew up at. With um, we used to there used to be a house there, and that's no longer there. But there's still a path, and I can still get out there and. Um, just kind of hang out by the river, um, just kind of smell all the smells that I really miss. So um, this one's really important. If this one says uh, uh, to understand the sense of self or your identity, to have some pride in your talents um, and then have integrity in your efforts and actions. So this is interesting because native people, uh, if you're raised traditionally, you are not supposed to boast about yourself. You um, are to be humble and things. And But one of the things that we've always had is that each person had a place in our tribal community, right? They, they had a role to play. Um, and so today it might be a little bit harder for us to kind of understand what our role is and how you contribute to your community. And um, to understand that you have talents, you have skills, you have knowledge that can be shared and that can be um, can be of value for the community. And so, just to find your a, a rooting in that, right, and to um, to feel good about yourself in that way um, as an individual, but then you're helping the whole community. Um, it's a little harder because it sort of tends to feel like you're boasting or that you're um, kind of put, putting yourself in a spotlight. But that's really um, that's really not the point of this one. 
it's um it's more about just recognizing your your talents and, and who you are uh, vitamin D vitamin D is very 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 interesting um, so I was asked to open a conference for um, an all native physicians conference at one one time and I was lucky enough to to be allowed to stay for that and to listen to a lot of the topics. And one of the physicians brought up vitamin D. And most of us as native people are experiencing a, a um, lack of vitamin D. Vitamin D is really, really important. It helps your mental health, but it also helps your immune system. So um, that, one's, that one's a big one. Um, for us Meskwaki, we were once um, sturgeon eaters. And so we were getting um, omega threes and we were getting vitamin D. We were spending a lot more, all of us were spending a lot more time outside. And so the sunlight is one of those places that you can get vitamin D. Um, but right now, the way that we live, I would even suggest um, supplementing with that, which is what we do in my, in my household. And of course, everyone wants clean water. So um, it's really important for all of us to think about that in terms of um, these pipelines and um, but just just as a basic human need and right is to have clean water um, so again this is something that kind of goes beyond um, just our individual selves but is can be a political thing as well your food can be either medicine or it can be um, literally addicting. It can be like a drug that actually um, destroys your health. So um, I'm not going to say <laughs> don't ever eat fry bread ever again. Um, but I will say that that's, uh, that's a movement toward decolonization, correct? And then it's also something that really we know for a fact is changing um, how we feel physically, how we um, process mentally, how we feel emotionally, um, those types of foods, right? Fast food and things that are, um, at one time we were, they were special because oh, we couldn't quite afford them. And so, but now we can, now we feel like, oh, I can just go to the store and buy whatever I want. So I'm gonna eat whatever I want. Well, your body is really craving the things that um, it's gonna recognize. So. Um, and that's not necessarily one of them. Uh, I, and like I said, I'm not going to tell you um, fry bread is completely prohibited, but to start thinking about, well, why is it that we have it in, um, where did it, why did it become such a um, sentimental where, attachment? Why did that happen? Um, and then to challenge yourself to not have it quite as much because you know what it's doing to yourself. And especially with our rates of diabetes and cancer, that's not something that is um, going to help you. It's actually making you more sick. Um, one of the things that my husband brought up and I'm gonna, I'm gonna use him as, a, as an example and then also as um, a story that he had told me. He was in ceremony and the people in there were asking for others to pray for them because they were dealing with things like cancer, heart disease, um, diabetes. They were they were physically ill, and they were asking for prayer. And when they got out of ceremony and had the meal afterwards, there was uh, chips, candy, fry bread, and they brought the fry bread by him and offered him some and he said no he looked he looked at them and said no and they all kind of like stopped and looked at him really strangely and and well why not he said we just got done praying for these people to for their health um, so that they won't be sick and yet we're going to serve them this so i felt that that was very poignant and it's something that i should now share quite more often and um uh, other part of this is that my husband is actually one of those examples of um, how you can change your health by what you eat, by what, what your choices are. So when we got together, he started to eat more like me 
and it was asking questions. Well, why do you do this? Or why do you not eat this? Or why do you eat this? Right. And so um, he started to ask me, well, how do you prepare this? And so just different things. And um, so he started to change the way that he ate as well. He used to be on a medication, um, excuse me, he used to be on three different medications and he no longer uses any of those. Um, and also does not need anxiety medication, which he was using before. And um, my great aunt, which is kind of strange to say, but um, she also um, no longer needed her high blood pressure medicine um, once I started cooking for her. So um, those are two examples um, directly that I directly witnessed that um, detriment, right? And this, I think, is very important as well. Um, I mentioned the kinship system, but to think about this as a tribal person or as a native person, um, there's absolutely no way that any tribe could have ever survived without love. Um, that might sound a little love and light and all of that, but it's really the truth. There's a lot of respect and love for each other, and that's how we all survived. And so, um, to bring that back is another part of our healing. Okay. That was so good. What a good presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, I think that we actually are just going to skip questions today because we didn't, I think everybody's just so in awe of your presentation and we didn't really have a lot of questions. I think we just all have so much to think about. Um, but we just are so thankful that you gave this talk today. Thank you the chat. Mm -hmm. Oh, and then I just wanted to make sure that everybody saw the link that we put into the chat. That's another um, additional resource that Stephanie wanted everybody to be able to see um, about food. So thank you so much for giving this talk today. And, um, and this will be recorded if people would like to look at it later at a later date. So, okay. okay. Bye. Thank you all very Thanks. much.